welcome to Hollywood. The Armed Forces Radio and Television Service brings you the Hollywood Radio Theater, starring Arlene Dahl in Sangaree and Cesar Romero. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Sangaree is not only the name of tonight's exciting drama, but of a magnificent plantation owned by the family of a lovely, high-spirited girl who despises the handsome man her father has chosen as overseer. As our stars of this Pine Thomas production for Paramount, Arlene Dahl, starring in her original role in Sangaree, and Cesar Romero. Now act one of Sangaree, starring Arlene Dahl as Nancy, and Cesar Romero as Carlos. The time, a night in October, 1781. The October of Cornwallis's surrender at Yorktown. And the place, an army encampment in Vermont. The rain beats heavily against the faces of the sentry. In the center of the stockade, the wind claws at the shutters of General Darby's cabin. And then, out of the darkness and storm... Oh! Who goes? Your name and mission or I fire. Dr. Carlos Morales to see General Darby. If he's still alive. Where is he? Cabin right ahead, sir. Thank you. Ah, I hoped it was you, Carlos. Your father. How is he, Roy? He's very weak. I operated on him two days ago. And uh, it gave him relief? Only temporary. Come, he's, he's impatient to see you. I came as quickly as I could, sir. Oh, Roy, a basin of water, please, so I can wash up. Yes. Oh, if you're planning to examine me, Carlos, you waste your time. That is not why I sent for you. Then why, sir? Roy, show him the contract. The agreement. The agreement? Yeah. It requires only your signature. Uh, must I read it now? Yes. Very well. Oh, it's a bitter thing to die away from a man's home. So far from Georgia and the plantation. Roy. Yes, Father. When I'm gone, I want you to ride south at once. When you reach Savannah, go straight to the editor of the Gazette. Gabriel Thatch? Yes. Tell him the terms of my will and of the agreement which Carlos has signed. No, General. I have not signed. I cannot. Carlos. No man living owes to another what I owe to you, sir. You gave me an education. You made a doctor of me. But I cannot accept an agreement which gives me control of your estate and fortune. That job belongs to Roy. Carlos, if you will look at that agreement, you will see I have already signed it myself. I am no good at business. That's why Father and I want you to run things. Do you speak also for your wife? Martha? Why? Why should she object? You and Martha grew up together. You have so much in common. Yes. Both of us born of bond servants. Children of indentured parents, hardly better than slaves. Carlos. And now you ask me to administer the Derby estate, to run the largest and richest company in all Georgia. No, the fine ladies and gentlemen of Savannah would hardly stand for that. They will. If you have a firm hand and a strong will. You have both. You forget another strong will, sir. You, you know I've never met your daughter, but... I've heard reports that Nancy is as stubborn a fighter as her soldier father. She's a woman. You'll know how to deal with her. <laughs> oh, Roy, some water, quickly. Yes. <laughs> sign the agreement, Carla, sign. General, I... I... A dying man's request if you had any gratitude for Gratitude? Very well. Signed. Thank you. And one thing more. When you get to Sangri, yes, you, you and Nancy, 
General. Here you are, Father. Drink this in. Carlos. Yes. It's all over. Or should I say, it's just the beginning? Your father never explained why he wanted you to see me. No, Gabe, only that I was to come to Savannah and give the terms of his will to the editor of the Gazette. Yeah, and unusual terms they are. Perhaps that's why the general wanted me to have him first to print in the Gazette and prepare the people for Dr. Carlos Morales. I rather think that's it. Public opinion is going to be very important. Yes, but what about private opinion? Your sister Nancy's in particular. <laughs> I stopped off at Sangaree on the way down here. Nancy says she intends to fight Carlos, even if it means taking the world to court. Well, at least the Gazette's not going to lack for news items. Roy, when will Dr. Morales reach Savannah? Uh, sometime this afternoon. He's coming down the river by flatboat. By flatboat? <laughs> the man who may control the biggest fortune in Georgia? <laughs> You'd better get used to it, Gabe. Carlos is a man of many surprises. Pilot. Pilot. Yes, sir. I think you've got a passenger in that rowboat. No passenger for me, sir. By the looks of the wind, she hasn't a penny for passage. Oh, yes, I have. Fifty cents to take you to Savannah. Harry! Stop the sweep. Sir, a hand up with you, please. By all means, a pleasure. <sighs> all right, let's see the money. Here you are. Next time, maybe you'll believe a lady. <laughs> a lady? <laughs> a barefoot wench with 50 cents and all of a sudden, she's a lady. Well, my girl, what's your name? Dolly Lay. But uh, where I come from, a gentleman usually introduces himself first. <laughs> then, uh, Dr. Carlos Morales, late of the first Georgia Volunteers, at your service. Dr. Morales? Well, <laughs> I sort of hoped I'd get a look at you. Oh? And uh, why? Because I work for Miss Nancy Darby at Sangaree. All anybody hears around there is how uh, Dr. Morales is going to come and manage her affairs. And uh, what does Miss Nancy say to that? <laughs> <laughs> She'll fight me, eh? Very well, then I shall fight her. Oh, but a gentleman doesn't fight a lady. Even if she fights him? What other course is there? Unless perhaps to make love to her. Is uh, that your advice? How can I say, sir? I, uh, I don't know how well you make love. Hmm. Well, uh, perhaps if I demonstrate... Oh, with a servant girl like me, Doctor? Well, why not a girl like you? I used to be a Derby servant myself. My father sold himself for seven years to come to this country from Spain. Come. Let us be friends. There's a bottle of wine in the cabin. I'm not thirsty. Then, uh, afraid? Oh, me? I'm not afraid of any man. <laughs> then join me in a glass. Come. Uh, we Spanish have a saying, Dolly... In wine, there is truth. I see. And uh, you hope liquor will loosen my tongue about Nancy Darby, hmm? Isn't turnabout fair play? She sent you here to find out everything she could about me. Dr. Morales... How do I know this? Well, a beautiful girl like you hardly travels alone in this part of the country. And when she turns out to be Miss Nancy Darby's maid, who takes passage on a boat whose only other passenger is Dr. Carlos Morales... <laughs> Then, uh, I smell spy. So now, um, now we drink. Um, tell me, Doctor, what, uh, what right is you to expect Nancy Darby to deal fairly with you after all you've done to her family? Done? What have I done? Oh, everybody knows the story. 
how uh, how General Darby took an interest in you as a boy, and how he how he sent you to the finest medical school, saw that you graduated with his own son, Roy, and then how you showed your gratitude when the general was delirious and dying. You tricked him into putting the Darby estate in your hands. So that's what they're saying in Savannah. <laughs> yes. And that's what Harvey Bristol will say when he takes the general's will to court. Harvey Bristol? Miss Darby's lawyer. And uh, also her fiancé. I see. A man who wants to love, honor, and cherish Nancy's fortune. Why, you... (laughs) (laughs) Well, that suggests still another idea. That Miss Darby's own maid is in love with Harvey Bristol. Is it true? (laughs) Suppose you ask Miss Darby about that. You'll see her tonight. I will. Her brother Roy and his wife are given a reception in your honor, a word with which I doubt you're acquainted. Now, you listen to me, girl. Oh, my arm. You're hurting me. The next time you see your mistress, tell her I wouldn't touch the Darby estate, except I made a promise to a dying man, and that promise will be kept. Oh, let me go. Will you tell her that? Please. Now, let me give you something else to report. Oh. <laughs> Ah. There, now, you won't forget that. Oh, I won't forget, Dr. Morales. No. And tell your mistress also that if she's half as charming as a maid, she can count me as her most devoted servant. Yes? Who is it? Roy. Are you dressed? Oh, just finishing. Come in. Yes, they're beginning to arrive. Everybody's asking for you. Including your sister, Nancy? <laughs> There's always an exception, you know. She's furious with Martha and me for having you here as our house guest. It won't be for long, Roy. I'll find my own quarters as soon as possible. Oh, please. No, that wasn't what Roy? I meant. Oh, Roy. In here, Martha. Roy, could you go down to the servants' quarters? Priam says one of the coachmen's very sick. Oh, of course. If you'll take Carlos downstairs, my dear, and do the honors for me... It's been a long time, Carla. Hasn't it? The swampland where you and I grew up together seems far, far away. <laughs> Martha Gillespie of Clay Creek. So pretty, but so poor. And now the wife of Dr. Roy Darby, heir of the Darby fortune. Only one of the heirs, Carlos. There's also Nancy. But perhaps the vents will soon take care of her. Am uh, I to be that event? <laughs> Come, let's go downstairs. There beneath you, you see the cream of Savannah society. Now let me point out your enemies. Can I trust you to know my enemies? Yes, because they are mine also. Those three gentlemen over there, the one on the right, that's Judge Armstrong, who will decide the case of General Darby's will if Nancy brings it to court. The man on the right, Harvey Bristol. Nancy, fiance. Uh huh. And, uh, the uh, elegant looking one in the middle. Harvey's father. And your rival in the medical field, Dr. Bristol. Mm. He and his son are also in the import and export business, which will improve greatly if Harvey marries into the Darby money. Martha Marcia. And this is our Felix. Felix Panyo. Dr. Morales. A pleasure, sir. Enchanté, doctor. You will excuse us, Felix. Of course. Uh, what about Pagnol? Another of Nancy's admirers. He chose our side during the war so he could plunder British ships. Now he doesn't care whose ships he plunders. A beautiful woman here in Savannah keeps him informed of sailing dates. You know who she is? Yes. And it's time that you met her. <laughs> Darling, may I present our guest of honor, Dr. Carlos Morales, Miss Nancy Darby. How do you do, Miss uh, Darby? How charming. You know, for a moment I had the feeling we'd met before. I think not, Doctor. Surely I would remember a man about whom I've heard so much. And especially such intimate details and from such a reliable source. Tell me, how is your dear Dolly Lake? She's very well. And now, excuse me, I've promised this dance to my fiancé.
Carlos. Ah, Roy. How's your coachman feeling now? He's seriously ill. From the symptoms, I'm almost inclined to suspect bubonic fever. What? The plague in Savannah? What's this about plague? I hope I'm wrong. It's one of the servants. Oh, uh, Dr. Bristol, may I present Dr. Morales? How do you do, sir? Yes. I'll give you my opinion without even looking at the case. There's no plague here in Savannah. And your proof? Any competent doctor, sir, knows that the plague is caused by a mist arising from the swamps at certain seasons of the year. This is the wrong season. And the right one in Africa. Africa? Yes. I hear there have been several deaths on the slave ships which might well have been caused by plague. And the bodies were buried at sea, so there's nothing to concern us here in Savannah. I am not so sure. Carlos, perhaps tomorrow you might examine the patient? Uh, Carlos? Hmm? Oh, oh, yes, of course. Uh, if if you gentlemen will excuse me, I, I think I see a friend out in the patio. I um, hope you came out here to wait for me. What? Oh, forgive uh... me. <laughs> I thought it was Dolly Lake. And instead, we have the very proper Miss Nancy Darby. Dr. Morales, I'm waiting for my fiancé, so if you don't mind... But I do. I... Tell me, does Harvey Bristol kiss as well as I? Doctor, if you're trying to humiliate... It is me, I, I who've been humiliated, Miss Darby. You came aboard the flatboat, you posed as your own maid for one purpose. To convince yourself that I am a vulgar, uncultured backwoodsman. Which you have shown yourself to be. Why? Because I preferred the servant wench to the lady? I still do. It matters little which you prefer, because you'll be master of neither. Tomorrow, Harvey Bristol files my suit to set aside my father's will. Next time you see me, Dr. Morales, and the last time, we'll be in court. <laughs> Counsel for Miss Darby is entitled to speak first. Mr. Harvey Bristol. Your Honor, we have shown that the will of the late General Darby must be set aside for two reasons. First, there is a grave threat to the peace and welfare of this state if General Darby's instructions are carried out. Think of it. He orders the establishment of a free medical clinic and schools for the children of servants and slaves. Why, he even goes so far as to order payment of wages to bondsmen so that they can buy their freedom before their terms of indenture are finished. What does any sane man imagine this would do to our economy? This leads me to my second point, that at the time of the execution of this will, General Darby was not of sound mind. If he had been sane... He was appointed his son, Roy, as trustee. Harvey, you heard me tell the court I didn't want that responsibility. <coughs> there, there will be no comments, please. Your Honor, who did General Darby appoint as trustee? A man born of indentured servants, raised in the backwards, an uncultured lunatic to carry out a lunatic will, drafted by a lunatic. I'll protest that statement, Mr. Bristol. Protest and be hanged, order, sir. Order, order. Gentlemen, have you finished your summation, Mr. Bristol? Yes, Your Honor. And the floor is yours, Dr. Morales. Your Honor, I, uh, I wish to address my remarks to the plaintiff in this case. I'm going to ask her for an honest answer to one question, and I'll let my case stand or fall by her answer. And uh, your question, Dr. Morales? Miss Darby, during your father's lifetime, he amassed the largest fortune in Georgia and spent unselfishly in the cause of American freedom both in peace and in the war just ended. Were these actions, Miss Darby, the work of a madman? Do you believe your father was insane? Of course he was insane. I put the question to the plaintiff. Miss Darby, was your father insane? No. No. He was the wisest man I've ever known. And I hate you, Harvey, for trying to make me say he wasn't. Gentlemen, gentlemen... In view of Miss Darby's testimony, this court must rule that General Darby's will is valid. Dr. Morales is confirmed as trustee. Oh, Miss Darby. Nancy. Uh, I... Dr. Morales, I suppose you expect me to congratulate you. No. I don't want your congratulations. I want more. So very much more. Don't press your victory too hard, Doctor. 
Remember, I'm a general's daughter, and I know a good bit about strategy. You've won the battle. But perhaps I shall win the war. Act two of Sangaree in a moment. Our servicemen around the world have a wonderful opportunity to observe new customs and traditions. And they're finding out that these ideas of other people aren't so strange after all. For instance, in many areas, there's a belief that trees and their products bring good luck. This undoubtedly dates back to the earliest existence of man, but continues to the culture of other people. On many Pacific islands, branches are used to ward off evil spirits or to cure diseases. In some of the western countries, certain trees are thought to be lucky for the person who touches them. Well, this might sound strange, but as our servicemen have observed, it's reflected in our own culture, too. We say that when we want good luck for the future, we knock on wood. How oh, that doesn't make us superstitious or primitive, we may not even believe in it. We, well, we just do it from habit. We also put a lot of stock in the Christmas tree. And the people of some other countries, this business of bringing trees into the house may look pretty strange. We have another very delightful belief in the effectiveness of a sprig of mistletoe, particularly if a pretty girl's standing underneath it. So you see, we share in our own way this age-old belief of other people. True enough, the customs and traditions of people vary around the world. But while a way of doing things may be different, the ideals remain the same. These customs and traditions are important to the people who follow them. And our servicemen are helping to maintain goodwill by observing the customs of other people in other lands. Now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of Sangaree, starring Aline Dahl as Nancy and Cesar Romero as Carlos. Even in the year 1781, news traveled fast. Before the day was out, all Savannah knew that Nancy Darby had lost her court battle with Dr. Carlos Morales. Now it is early evening. In the library of a Darby townhouse, Carlos and Nancy's brother enjoy a glass of port. I think a toast is in order. To you, Carlos. And may your administration of the Darby estate bring about the speedy reunion of my sister and me. I sincerely hope so, Roy. Well, I suppose Nancy will retire to the plantation and wait for my next move. I hear that she's returning to Sangaree this evening. And, uh, speaking of this evening, I have plans for us, Carlos. Oh, yes? At nine o'clock, the town council meets to elect a new health officer. I'd like you to come along with me. But I'm not a member of the town council. Well, you are now. As trustee of the Derby estate, you automatically become a member. And tonight, I hope you'll also be our new health officer. You think I'll be elected? <laughs> You'd better be, because the only other candidate is Dr. Bristol. Ah, I see, yes. Nancy's future father-in-law. Don't remind me of that, please. <laughs> Dr. Darby, sir. Yes, Prim. It's about Hector, sir. You you asked me to come and fetch you if he was worse. Yes, I'll come at once, Prim. It's too late, sir. He's dead. Oh. All right, Prim, I'll take care of all the arrangements. Thank you, sir. Oh, Roy. Shh. Wait. We can't keep it a secret much longer, Roy. To fight the plague, we've got to bring the facts out in the open. And throw all Savannah into panic? But we've got to find out how the plague is being brought in. We must know where and how Hector came in contact with the disease. It may be impossible. Hector was a freed man. He'd been in my employ only a few days before he took sick. But before that? Well, he worked for Felix Pagnol, the ship owner. Pagnol. Hmm. Very interesting. Nancy's friend. Go, oh, Carlos. Who is Nancy's friend? I'd like to find just one. Felix Pagnol. Oh, yes. I'd like to talk to him. Well, his offices are... No, I mean right now, tonight. I doubt Felix Pagnol lets anyone know of his whereabouts or activities after dark. I have heard that he spends considerable time in one of the waterfront taverns. After all, he hires a great number of sailing men. And the name of this place? Tondi's Tavern. But see here, Carlos, I'm expecting you at that town council meeting. Now, I'll be there, Roy, after I've seen Monsieur Pagnol. Some mulled wine. Here, this chair. Thank you. 
Yes, it is a pleasure to buy a drink for a man who has scored two victories over Harvey Bristol in the same day. Pietro, two more wines over here. You say two victories? One in court this afternoon, the other is a natural consequence. Nancy Darby has broken off her engagement to Mr. Bristol. Oh? Well, since you know it before anyone else, I uh, gather you are very close to Miss Darby. I am in love with her. Hmm. <laughs> You're quite a surprising man, sir. Not what I've been led to expect. By Martha Darby, perhaps. But of course. She has told you that my ships are privateers, that I myself am a pirate. Both are untrue. If you were a pirate, you would hardly make a public confession of the fact. True, <laughs> true. Well, regardless of what you may or may not be, Monsieur Bagnol, I'd like to ask some questions about a freedman who used to be in your employ. More recently, he's been a coachman for Dr. Darby. Oh, uh, you mean Hector? Yes. I want to know everything about him. Who his friends were, where he spent his spare time, the name of his girl, if he had one. You have a reason, Doctor. Which I cannot explain at the moment. All right. All right, where is he? Doctor, do not look around. Who is this? Harvey Bristol, who is very drunk. A huge and very evil brute who once worked on one of my ships. I'm looking for a fine dog called Morales. A dog, a dog that needs a whipping. All right, Bristol. If you're looking for a duel. Duel? Duel's only between gentlemen. The Goliath here is going to break your skull. <laughs> I see. A broken skull to match your broken heart. The bridegroom without the bride or her money. Go on, Goliath. Now! Now! All right, Bristol. Now, now it's your turn. Bristol! He left rather hurriedly, Doctor. I think he had an engagement elsewhere. Oh. And you, my friend, need some cool night air. Uh, Come along. Monsieur Pagnol, you, uh, you were about to tell me what you know of Hector. Was I? Then I'm afraid we must postpone it until later. You see, a lady waits for me. This carriage. Good evening. Oh, Nancy. Am I on time, Billy? Exactly, my dear. If you will excuse us, Doctor, I have promised to escort Miss Darby back to her home at Sangaree. Nancy, I must talk to you. I don't think we have anything to talk about. Please, please. I, I want you to be a director of the Darby Company. I want you to help me manage the estate. Which I intend to do, regardless of what any judge or court may say. I shall continue to be the mistress of Sangaree. As you wish. But I shall expect a regular accounting. For that, you must come to Sangaree. I shall tomorrow. Until then, farewell. Gentlemen, <clears throat> gentlemen, I'm afraid we can't delay proceedings any further. The chair has before the nomination of Dr. Bristol as health officer of the city of Savannah. George Armstrong. Dr. Darby? I had wanted Dr. Morales to be here when I nominated him. However, in view of your impatience, I now submit his name in nomination. I second it. Very well, gentlemen. Dr. Bristol and Dr. Morales are both nominated. Now, are you ready to vote? Yes, ready. All in favor of Dr. Bristol will raise their right hands. Mm-hmm. I count... Uh, six for Dr. Bristol. Well, Lick, it's going to be a tie, and to break it, Judge Armstrong will have to vote. And his vote will go to Bristol. Now, all those for Dr. Morales, raise your hands, please. Two, three, four, five, six. I count six for Dr. Morales. Seven, sir. I vote for myself, as I'm sure Bristol has already done. <laughs> I, uh, very well, Dr. Morales. It, it appears that you have won. You are hereby appointed health officer of Savannah. Gentlemen, I'd uh, like to make a statement. But first, you, Mr. Thatch, must forget that you are editor of the Gazette for the next few minutes. My words must not go beyond this room. You have my promise, Doctor. Good. Gentlemen, Dr. Darby and I have proof that the bubonic plague is here in Savannah. What? We must find a remedy for this situation without causing panic among the people. As a first step, I propose a program of rat extermination. You say rats, Doctor? Yes. 
They are one of the most dangerous carriers of the disease. And just how, sir, do you propose to carry out this program of yours? We'll begin by fumigating every warehouse in town. We'll inspect them all do and... Do not inspect my warehouse. Well, Dr. Bristol... I it... know what you're after, Barali. You want to get at my business secrets. You and the Derby Company want to take over the Bristol import and export trade. You want my customers and my ships. All right. Open the window. Good heavens. A pirate ship. What? Attack on a vessel right inside of town? Yes. There's the real problem we should be worrying about. Let's forget about the plague and hunt down those pirates. They may possibly go together, Dr. Bristol. We all know the pirate ships are riddled with disease. And we know also that they have spies right here in Savannah. Men who might be the very carriers of the plague. Well, Morales, you're our health officer. What are you going to do? I... I don't know. At least, not yet. Miss Darby? Yes? Dr. Morales is here. Oh, Ask him to come in, Priam. I am in. Welcome to Sangaree, Doctor. Carlos. You look surprised. <laughs> I am. I hardly expected such a cordial welcome. But you are welcome. And may, may I say, you are beautiful. Thank you. And your dress, it's... It's exquisite. I wore it particularly for you. You're lovely, Nancy. Uh, and, uh, and now where shall we begin? Do you want to check over my account books first, or, or, uh, shall I show you around the plantation? Well, I should like to see the plantation. I'll be ready in ten minutes. And uh, that acreage across the river has just produced the largest crop of rice in Sangaree's history. And the cotton on this side? Our second largest crop. 500 bales are going aboard the Derby Bell this afternoon. <laughs> I'd heard that Sangaree was in a state of decay. Oh, it was. During the early part of the war. But Felix has helped me to bring it back. Felix Spagnol? Yes. Father lent him a good deal of money, and, well, this is his way of repaying it. Then it was not just because he's in love with you. <laughs> Did he tell you he was? Oh, I never believe anything Felix says or or anything people say about him. Nancy, Fagnol is in love with you. Please. Please, there are other subjects besides Felix. I've still got a lot to show you. Nancy. Uh... The warehouse, the loading of the Derby Bell, and after dinner, my account books. Nancy. Are you in love with Pagnola? Come on, Carlos. I'll raise you to the warehouse. That's an odd question for you to ask. Of course I trust Captain Bronson. Well, that's why he's master of the Derby Bell. I'm not worried. Well, I am. Simply because that ship is sailing with a fortune in her hold. The pirates are hungry for a cargo of prime cotton and tobacco. More coffee, sir? Huh? Oh, oh, yes, please, Priam. Perhaps you didn't see those casks of gunpowder going aboard from our warehouse. The Derby Bell can take care of herself. Against a fully armed pirate ship, manned by experienced cutthroats? No. Well, have you any suggestions? Yes. Uh, in a moment. Oh. Uh... Priam. Yes, miss. That's all, thank you. You may go. Yes, ma'am. Well. The Derby Bell sails tonight. The pirates will be waiting for her to clear the coast early tomorrow morning. That is if they have spies in Savannah watching for her. I'm sure they have. But suppose that tonight the spies see 50 barrels waiting on the Savannah Wharf. Each barrel marked Derby Company and consigned to the Derby Bell. I... Uh, then they'll think the Derby Bell plans to stop and load at Savannah instead of going directly to sea. Yes. The pirates won't be looking for her until hours after she's reached open sea. Oh. But uh, 
But how will you get the barrels done? Uh, your brother, Roy, and I will attend to that. Right now, I need a fast horse. Oh, Carlos. Oh, yes? Please, please be careful. Are, uh, are you concerned for your brother? For you both. Thank you, Nancy. Last one, Carlos? Yeah, the last. Whew. Well, now I, I think we deserve a drink. Well, turn these taverns at the foot of the wall. All right, why not? By the way, Carlos, while you were up at Sangaree, we took our first steps against the plague. We fumigated all the warehouses along these docks, except Bristol. Why not his? He says he'll fumigate his own warehouse in his own good time. We'll see about that. <laughs> See those barrels there on the wharf? They're there just to fool us. They're empty. Wait a minute. Let's see How this. do you know they're empty? <laughs> the word just came for Sangaree. They expect us to wait for the Darby Bell to load here at Savannah while she slips out to sea. <laughs> yeah, but we'll fool them. We'll be ready for her when she reaches the sound. Why? So loud, you fool. Come on. Carlos, the ship's as good as lost. Perhaps not. With the tide in, a light boat could cut across the marshes and gain 15 miles between here and the bay. Wait, now, Gabriel Fletch has a light sloop. Then get hold of him. I'll go up to the Derby warehouse and get some powder and fuses. Will it do any good, Carlos? The pirates seem to know everything we plan. How do they do it? I can give you that answer. But later. Right now, I've got to get to the warehouse at Sangri. <laughs> Good evening, Nancy. Oh. Oh. oh, it's you, Carlos. I saw the light and wondered who was here in the warehouse. What's wrong? What are you doing with gunpowder and fuses? Yes. You must be very curious. This is something else you must tell Felice Pagnol. You must keep your pirate friends informed. What are you saying? That you're a spy and a traitor. I... You've done everything to, ha to hand the Derby Bell over to the pirates. No. Why would I want them to take my own ship? To get all the profits instead of one-third. To ruin the Darby Company and me. Martha Darby warned me about you, but I wouldn't believe. Martha? Oh, Carlos, you've got to trust no, me. No, I've trusted you too much already. Carlos, wait! Please! In a moment, Act Three of Sangaree. At the time when the city of Berlin was blockaded and American Air Force planes were making regular airlifts into the city, Lieutenant Gail Halverson got an extra special idea. He tied his handkerchief to some candy and chewing gum and dropped the uh, candy chute from his plane. Well, this was the beginning of Operation Little Vittles. And soon, from the aircraft of Lieutenant Halverson and his buddies, Thousands of candy shoots dropped every day to the German children around Tempelhof Air Force Base. Americans at home heard of the project and sent handkerchiefs to make the tiny parachutes. To the desperate blockaded city, it was a symbol of kindness, of generosity, and of hope for the future. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. We pause now for station identification. Curtain Rises on Act Three of Sangaree, starring Arlene Dahl as Nancy and Cesar Romero as Carlos. The moon and stars are blotted out by heavy clouds as a small sloop glides silently and swiftly across the flooded marshes and enters the sound where the pirate ship rides at anchor. At the helm of the sloop is Gabriel Thatch. Up forward, Carlos and Roy Darby carefully attach fuses to two casks of gunpowder. Carlos. Keep your voice down, Gabe. 
I thought I saw a light off the starboard. I don't see anything. That's about where the pirate might be, though. Hiding close into shore. There. There's the light again. Yes, I see it. That's our game, all right. And close. Gabe, throw us those pistols. All right. They'll catch. Roy! Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Hey! No light there! Oh, they heard us. Yes. All we can do now is try to ram head on and swim for it. Gabe, tie down the rudder. Right. Ahoy, sloop! Identify yourself or we fire. Roy, ready with the fuses. Ready. Light them. All hands, a boarding party! Now, boys, overboard and head for shore. Right. But you, Gabe, not a scratch. Huh? There's one pirate that'll never sail again. She's going down. The last of Felix Pagnot. I'm not so sure. No may own and direct his sea raiders, but I doubt he'd risk his neck aboard one. No, I think we'll find him at, um, at Sangaree. Nancy? Yes, Prim? Mr. Harvey Bristol to see you. At this hour of the night? Tell him... Tell him I've gone to bed. Yes, but you haven't. Nancy, I need your help and you need mine. You may go, Prim. Yes, ma'am. Just how, Harvey, do you propose to help me? How? Well, first of all, I have a plan of how we can remove Morales from control of the Derby Company. Oh? You, uh, you tried that once before, I believe. Nancy, tomorrow I want you to file charges that Dr. Morales has embezzled funds from the Derby Company. Embezzled? But that's not true. Well, what's it matter? The mere charge will turn his so-called friends against him. Yes, and get him thrown out as town health officer and stop this ridiculous fumigation of the warehouse. You mean your father's warehouse, don't you? Nancy, are you or are you not going to help me get rid of Morales? I am not. Very well. I'll take care of him in my own way. And this time he'll get more than a beating. Harvey, no. In case you have any ideas of warning him, I'm locking you in this room. What? Priam? Oh. Priam! Yes, sir? Station yourself outside this door and don't let the servants or anyone through to Miss Darby. Yes, Mr. Bristol. Priam! Priam takes orders from me, my dear. I'm sorry, miss. We're both sorry. And now, good night. Priam, unlock this door. I'm sorry, miss, I can't. Oh. I wouldn't try to get out that window, miss. It's a long, long way to the ground. Martha, I'm changing clothes. Really, Carlos? I've seen a man without his shirt and waistcoat before. <laughs> Would you hand them to me, please? Thank you. Roy tells me that you and he and Gabriel Thatch are on a pirate hunt. Yes. You were right, Martha, about Nancy and Pagnol. Nancy and Pagnol? They're working together, just as you said. Oh, Carlos, you haven't said anything about this to my husband. No, I, I, I don't know how to tell him. It's, it's easier if Roy catches his sister and Pagnol with the evidence. That's why we're going to Sangaree. No, Carlos, don't. What? Forget about the pirates. Paniol is a dangerous man. He wouldn't hesitate to kill all of you. Oh, no. Please, Carlos, I don't want this on my head. I should never have told you anything. Well, I'm very glad you did. Carlos, don't go. Stay away from Sangaree. Carlos! See that path just ahead of us? Turn off there. It's a shortcut. Go ahead. We'll follow you. What's wrong? Look ahead of us, down in the path. It's the body of a woman. It's Nancy. Oh. Nancy. Oh. Oh, Carlos. I, 
I got away. I jumped from the window. You what? I I wanted to warn you. I, uh... Nancy! Nancy! What happened? Is she... She's unconscious. Looks like a head injury. Well, Roy, are there any medical supplies of Sangaree? Yes, I've always kept a complete medical kit there, even for surgery. All right. Help me get her on my horse. And Gabe. Yes. Get to Sangaree as fast as you can. Tell the servants to start boiling some water. We may have to operate. All right. Now, another bandage. Thank you. You're a fine surgeon, Carlos. Thank you. Well, my friends, I've talked to all the servants except one who seems to be missing. As far as I can find out, Felix Paniol hasn't been here in days. And he's probably still in Savannah. Uh, and after blowing up his ship, he must know somebody's on his trail. He'll hardly be waiting for us in his office. No, he'll surround himself with some of his friends. And you know where they hang out. Uh, Tondi's Tavern. Well, we don't dare walk into a trap like that. We'll see. And Roy, we means Gabe and I. You're staying here with Nancy in case there are complications. All right. But be careful, both of you. Carlos, we've been waiting almost an hour. You know, Pernod's got to come out of the tavern sometime. His carriage is still there waiting for him. I'm ready to walk right inside after him. Anything to win. Come back here. Stay in the doorway. That didn't come from the tavern. No, it came from over there. The alley. Bon nuit, messieurs. That's Pagnol. And alone. Yeah, quick, before he gets under the carriage. Pagnol! It is all right, gentlemen. I do not think he will fire at you again. Huh? I don't understand this. Come on. Uh, Dr. Morales, Mr. Thatch. It appears that you, too, were to be the victims of an assassin. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps the murders were to be blamed on me. With good reason, perhaps? I have been falsely accused of many crimes, Doctor. As I told you once before, I am not a pirate. But but then none of this makes sense. Perhaps it does. The face of the man who tried to kill you is quite familiar to me. He was once a mate on one of my ships. He left me to work for the Bristol Company. Wait, I recognize him, too. He's one of the men Roy and I overheard at the wharf last night. Uh, so? Yeah, we'd better talk to the Bristols. That may be difficult, gentlemen. Dr. Bristol and his son are at their warehouse, which they have surrounded with armed guards. It seems to have something to do with fumigation. And perhaps more than that. Come on, Gabe. We're going to find out. Nobody's entering my warehouse. I'll shoot the first man who tries... Maybe I can help you, Judge Armstrong. Oh, Dr. Morales, just the man we need. Maybe you can reason with the Bristols. They've been holding my men at bay for hours. Keep back there. There's going to be no trespassing on our property. Oh, Gabe. Yes. You try talking to the Bristols. Keep their attention. I'm going to try to work around in back of them. All right. Try to get into the warehouse through that side door. Then you can get your gun at their backs. That's my idea. Now get their attention. All right. Dr. Bristol. Harvey, listen to me. <laughs> Argue all you want, Thatch. My men have their orders. Yes, we'll fumigate our own warehouse without any meddling from you people. Now, clear out, all of you. Clear out before Drop we... Drop your guns, gentlemen. Oh, quiet. Quickly, Doctor. You too, Harvey. Tell your guards to throw down their rifles. All right, boys. Stop. Harvey, you told me you'd gotten rid of Morales. Almost, Dr. Bristol. It was a good try. Oh, well done, Morales. Bravo. Take a look inside the warehouse, Judge. What? There are rats by the hundreds and the bodies of five slaves, all dead of the plague. Are you sure it's the plague? I'm positive we found the source of the disease. And that's not all. There's a fortune in stolen cargoes inside there. Some of it's Derby property. This warehouse has got to be burned. Men, bring your torches. Well, what about the stolen merchandise? Burn it. <laughs> Get all the rest she needs. 
We can talk later on. You can talk now. Nancy. How are you feeling? Much better. I'm so glad you're all right. <laughs> that I'm all right? Roy told me why you were going back to Savannah. Yes. And Roy told me quite a bit, too. About Harvey locking you in the room and Priam being a Bristol spy. And all the time you thought I was. I was wrong. So terribly wrong to believe the lies of a jealous sister-in-law. Perhaps being jealous myself, it made it easier for me to believe. You? Jealous? I... Nancy, I think I've been in love ever since that first day we met. On a flatboat? Yes. I fell in love with Dolly Lake. Oh, I remember you kissed Dolly Lake. That's what made me fall in love with her. But you've never kissed Nancy Darby. No, that's right. Until now. In a moment, our stars will return. Make a friend, and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. Ever heard of Billy Brown? Well, for over a year now, young Billy, a high school senior of Yorktown Heights, New York, has broadcast a 15-minute program over the voice of America. Every Friday, in answer to some letter from a pen pal, he talks about such varied subjects as sports, stamps, religious freedom, and American jazz. The program is repeated in Urdu, a language spoken in India and Pakistan, and beamed to Asia. In one month, Billy answered 627 letters from 35 countries. When one pen pal asked about student government in American high schools, Billy tape recorded a five-minute student meeting in his school. For a while, it looked as if Billy's program might be discontinued, but it had become so successful that the local Rotary Club set up a special committee to raise funds for its continuation and for the purchase of postage and stationery so Billy could continue to correspond personally with his overseas pen pals. Recently, Pakistan's ambassador to the U.S. and his family visited Billy at his home for a weekend. And later, the envoy invited the Brown family to Washington, where Billy received a reward for his, as the citation read, contribution to the growing spirit of brotherhood between the youth of America and the youth of Pakistan. Although Billy Brown plans to enter law school, he hopes to continue with his radio program, for, like so many other Americans, he's discovered that by helping others, you help your country. Now, here's Mr. Cummings with our star. And here they are, Arlene Dahl and Cesar Romero. <laughs> Next week, we're going to be in good company, too. It will be another of our 20 greats. It's one of the most thrilling stories to come out of World War II. Five Fingers. The story of a spy who sold Allied war secrets to the Nazis. And as our stars of this intriguing drama from 20th Century Fox, we have the excellent actor, James Mason, and his charming wife, Pamela Colino. Uh, it was a terrific picture, Irving. Good night. Good night. Good night, and see you again soon. Part of our cast tonight were Lamont Johnson as Roy, William Conrad as Thatch, Carlton Young as Spaniel, John Sutton as Harvey, Herb Butterfield as Bristol, Francis Robinson as Martha, and William Walker, Jack Crucian, Leo Britt, Bill Boucher, and Eddie Marr. <laughs> Hollywood Radio Theater is produced by Irving Cummings. Our orchestra is directed by Rudy Schrager. This is your announcer, Ken Carpenter, inviting you to be with us again next week at this same time for another presentation of the Hollywood Radio Theater. United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.